This lesson is about histograms. Remember that a variable is the question we ask in statistics and we try to gather data, which are the answers to that question. So our variable can either be categorical, which is usually a kind of label or something that categorizes data. Usually your question is like, what's your favorite color? Or um, what grade are you in school? Junior, sophomore? It's something that you would answer in a word or something that is a number that is literally just a label. Um, Categorical data we talked about before can be displayed usually in a bar chart, a pie chart, segmented bar charts. Um, those are the kinds of things that we would look for in categorical data. And when we talk about categorical data, we talk about the most frequent category, the least frequent category, anything else we tend to think is interesting. And we can make comparisons from one group to another. Um, we can talk about association and independence of variables um, and compare sections of which has a greater proportion. Um, when we're talking about numerical data, were you generally talking about discrete variables like counts, how many, or we are talking about numerical variables that are measurements. Those will usually have units. In either case, you can measure those using dot plots if you have a small set of data, stem plots for small to medium, or histograms if you have a large set of data. So it's good to remember as we go through this that you really use a histogram when you have a lot of data. Um, if you have a small set of data, it's usually okay to use a stem plot or to use a, a dot plot for that. On the other side of that, if you have a large set of data, don't make a stem plot, don't make a dot plot. Those are inefficient ways to display that. So one thing to remember also about histogram is unlike a categorical bar chart, in a histogram, the bars are going to touch. Okay, now to construct a histogram, on your horizontal scales, um, depending on how your data is, if you've got discrete data, if you've got counts, a lot of times on your horizontal scale, you will literally just have the possible values of the variable, um, including any that you might be missing from the minimum to the maximum. So I have this problem down here and it says um, promiscuous raccoons. The data below gives the number of mating partners for a group of raccoons. So I guess they went out at night and watched all that business and saw what was going on. And so we would start off like we normally would with the lowest value and the highest value. And honestly, in a case like this, I'd probably make a dot plot. But to make a histogram is not too bad. After you get that data collected, you would want to include all the values between 1, 2, 3, and 4. And you'd want to count how many there are of each. So you would go through and say, okay, how many 1s are there? How many 2s are there? That's going to give you that frequency value. So that frequency value, how many? So in this case, there were 18 ones, five twos, three threes, and three fours, giving us a total, the sum of the frequencies of 29 different raccoons that were observed. To get the relative frequency, and remember this is the percentage. So to get this 0.621, we're taking 18 out of 29, that's where the 0.621 comes from. 5 out of 29 gives me the 0.172. So in order to graph this on a histogram, I'm going to start off on the horizontal axis, and I would have the number of partners, and that's my variable, and I would have 1, 2, 3, 4. Those are my possible values of the variable. And I'm going to, on my vertical scale, I can either have frequency, frequency is fine, or I can have relative frequency. Remember, if you're just dealing with one set of data, frequency or relative frequency are fine. But if you're comparing two sets of data, it's usually best to compare those using relative frequency, especially if their sample sizes are not the same. Okay, so we have our vertical axis is going to be scaled with either frequency or relative frequency. And our horizontal axis is going to be equally spaced. Those are the values of our variables. And then you draw a bar that's centered at that particular value. So at one um, this would be either 60% or at that 18 value, no matter how, and it's centered on there. And we would go out to the right, um, continuing to make those bars. Notice how the bars touch. Okay, so this is not a categorical bar graph. In a histogram, the bars are right next to each other, equally spaced. Okay, now if I was going to comment on this, because this is numerical data, I would talk about socks. I would talk about the shape, the outliers, the center, and the spread. So I've already got this done over here, but 
For example, if I'm going to talk about the stocks, I would put my context in there. The distribution of number of partners, there's the context, is skewed to the right. Okay, so we're definitely seeing a right skew um, with that tailing off onto the right direction um, with a peak at one partner. The median number, now in order to get this median, what I did was I thought, okay, to get the median, we're looking for the 50th percentile, or in other words, we're looking for where the data is split in half, and you've got 50% of the data on one side and 50% of the data on the other. And since the first category holds 62% of the data, that means if you were to line up all of these numbers, that 50% of them are to the left and 50% of them are to the right, and that line is going to be somewhere in the ones. Okay, so that, that one value there, that's going to be where our median is. And the range is three. That's going to be our maximum minus our minimum. So four minus one, three is my range. And so just kind of telling what is this story saying, it appears that raccoons are primarily monogamous um, with that one uh, partner there. So again, socks, let's just go through this really quick. Okay, do we have context? Yes, number of partners. Do we have the shape skewed to the right with a peak at one? Um, the outliers, there weren't any outliers here, so they weren't mentioned. Um, center, talking about where the median is. And a range, we're using that as our spread. All right. Um, if we were in class, we'd be doing a roll the dice activity, but for the sake of this video, that is being skipped. So to make a histogram, again, the idea is that you want to um, collect all of your data values and you want to put them in equal, equally spaced classes. So you can see each of these classes um, from 200 up to 249. Okay, so think from like 1 to 49 is 49 numbers. So from 0 to 49 is 50 values. So each one of these, so from 200 to 249, that's 50 values. From 250 to 299 is 50 values. There are 50 values in each of these piles. Most of the time, when you are dealing with these values, the number on the left is usually the one that's included, and the one on the right is usually the value that's not included. So when I go to make my bars, because they have to touch, I'm going to make them 200 to 250 to 300, 350, 400, 450, 500, 550. So even though this class only goes up to 249, what I'm really doing is I'm thinking this bar goes from 200 all the way up to 200, but not in 250, but not including it. Um, for those of you who've had other math classes, you can think about this in terms of on the left side of this, that 200 is a solid um, circle and on the right side it's an open circle like you would have graphed inequalities and in, say algebra or if you've been in a class that talked about boundaries and fences and sets and things like that you have a bracket on the left a closed um, set ender and then on the right you've got an open you've got a parenthesis right there so we think about this so I've got those scaled so they're each 50 wide but when I look at this bar that say goes from 600 to 650 I know what that's saying is that it includes the 600 and it goes all the way up 649.9999999999999 but at 650 now we're into the next bar Okay. On the vertical axis, first off, the vertical axis should never, ever, ever be broken Okay, on any sort of bar graph, whether it's a categorical bar graph or it is a histogram. Either one of those kinds of graphs, you should never break that vertical axis. And it always needs to be scaled. So you can see I'm going every 2%, 2%, 4%, 6%, 8%, 10%. So the bars touch. They go from boundary to boundary, and the rectangles go up to the height of that relative frequency. Um, so let's say you have a pile of data, and you're trying to decide how would you make one of these histograms. Okay, so one strategy that you can use, and it's kind of just sort of a general rule, is that if I want to know how many bars I need in my histogram, I can take the square root of n. So in this case, it says the data represent the percentage of college students enrolled in public universities in each state. So there are 50 numbers in this pile of numbers right here one for each state. And if I was going to take the square root of 50, I get a number that's about seven, a little bigger than seven because uh, 49 squared would be seven. So if I use seven intervals and I need to get from my lowest number to my highest number in this case, um, 
I'm trying to going from about 44 up to in the high 90s here. So I would want to make seven intervals and I and one I could make them about eight units to make that work. So I could go 44, 52, 60, 68, 76, 84, and 92. And that would get me from my very lowest number up to my very highest number with about the right amount of information. Okay. Um, unfortunately, that's going to be really hard to tally. I mean, it's no problem with this. It would make a great histogram. Um, it'd be very well constructed. But when I'm going through and finding my numbers, sometimes that's a little difficult to do. So a lot of people like to make their histogram using more um, traditional counting breakoffs. Like we, instead of using seven, maybe we use six and we make them each 10 wide. And we go down a little lower, 40 to 50, 50 to 60, 60 to 70, et cetera. That makes it easy to sort of tally and see how many that there actually are. Okay, so for example, if I was to use these, then I, I can scan easier and I can say, how many are there from 40 up to, but not including 50, there are two in that frequency. How many are there from 50 up to including 60? There are four of those, I can count those. I could continue to do that for each of these, tallying how many are gonna be in each of those sections. And notice that they're all the same units wide. Okay, once you've got them all collected into those categories, you are going to create your histogram. So on the horizontal axis, I'm gonna run my 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, up to 100, okay? And then I am going to um, put my, my bars as some sort of height. And I look over here, I'm gonna use relative frequency. It looks like my bars go from about 4% up to about 38%. So I just went 5%, 10%, 15%, 20%, etc. So I'm going by 5%, it's scaled here. My first bar goes from 40 to 50, then from 50 to 60, 60 to 70, 70 to 80, 80 to 90, 90 to 100, and I'm scaling it up and I actually um, use this relative frequency. It would not be inappropriate to use the frequency on that vertical axis either. It's just that anytime you're comparing two groups, if they're of different sizes, you typically wanna use relative frequency instead. That's the most appropriate way to compare two groups. Okay, but one group, either one in this case would be okay. Um, another thing, and even though I didn't do a very good job when I sketched this guy in, it really, the bars should be as equally width um, and sort of straight as possible, but they are kind of leaning in this picture based on the way I drew this. Okay, um, another little thing I just want you to point out here is um, I did break the horizontal axis. So instead of starting at zero, I started that at 40. Um, and so I put a little graph break in there to show that the scale doesn't start until after that first number, okay? And again, if I was checking this bar right here, um, the bar, I would read that as this is the numbers from 80 up to, but not including 90. So from 80 to 89.9999999, but as soon as I get to 90, I'm up into that next um, value there. Now, most of the time on the AP exam, you are not going to have to construct a histogram. You may have to sketch one, but to have one from scratch, you're probably not going to see that happen. But you may have to interpret what you see between ones. So one thing you might want to be able to do is just like we did with comparative dot plots and to comparative stem plots, you may want to compare two histograms. If you are going to construct a comparative histogram, and I think there's one of these in your homework as well, for a comparative histogram, just like with a comparative dot plot, you're going to have um, the number line be the same at the bottom. Okay, so my number line is the same at the bottom here. So this and this, even though it's not labeled on the top, I'm going to share that same scale and that same, um, the same scale, they're going to be positioned the same. Okay, the other thing... Um, that you'll notice is they have the same scale vertically as well. So you can see 0, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 0, 5, 10, 15, 25. Okay, so the first thing I'm looking at these two graphs and what do they have in common? And they both look pretty roughly symmetric. Um, down here, this one drops off a little bit more than I'd like to on the left-hand side, but for the most part, they're fairly symmetric. We do see a more pronounced peak in graph A than we do in graph B. Um, other things I notice is that um, it is labeled up here, but it does say very small mean. The first one has a mean of about 26, and the second one has a mean of about 5.6. If I wanted to find the median, 
I could try to count how many I thought there were total and I could count over to where I think the middle is. Okay, so if I'm talking about my socks, okay, shape, they're both rough, unimodal, roughly symmetric. Uh, I don't see any outliers. The center of A is obviously much larger than the center of B. And as far as the range goes, this one goes from about 48 down to zero. So it has a range of about 48. And this one goes from about 30 down to negative 18. So it also has a range of about 48. All right, so remember when I talk, I want to talk about socks in context. So I'm going to say the distributions of, and I look, and this one does not have the variable labeled. But that's not going to be a problem in your graph, because when you go to make this, you're going to make sure you have something with context on it. So whatever that variable is, the distribution of number of pencils in your backpack, the distribution of length or whatever, for type A and type B, are similar shapes. Both are unimodal and roughly symmetric. You could stick in a little sentence right here that said that the, um, the peak of graph A is more pronounced at 24, perhaps. Um, type A has a higher mean of 26.4 units than type B does. Um, both distributions have a similar range of about 48 units. You could also comment that neither distribution has outliers as a similarity. Okay. Now, do population? Well, how do population histograms resemble uh, their samples? So, if this is my population, this is all the individuals in a population. Okay, so we have this sort of skewed, right? Down here on the bottom are four different samples. That means we reached into that population and we grabbed some values and we're just plotting those few values. So one of the things you notice, and I think if you look at each of these, as as far as shape goes, these all, even though they're not the same, all have kind of that skewed right shape. So when you do take a sample from a, from a population, a lot of times the shape of the population can kind of be predicted from the shape of the sample. If the sample distribution, one of these fours down here, look skewed to the right, it's mostly very probable that the population histogram is also going to be skewed to the right. Similarly, if you had a sample histogram that was bimodal, you could make a guess that that population, that population distribution would probably also be bimodal. Um, the other thing that we could determine here would be, say, the uh, median value or the mean value. Now, the median occurs at 50%. And so if I look, this one's about 15 this one's about 15, and I'm looking for 50%. That's about 15, and this one's about, what, 22 or so? So I put those together, and I'm about 37%. So I haven't quite gotten to 50% yet. If I go over to this other 22%, that's going to get me into that 50th percentile. So that's going to be where my median is, somewhere in that bar, around 2. And I think if you look, all of these look like a about that two could be where that median is hitting. It's very similar if we look at those percentages. Another thing that um, we notice here is that you could figure out the range. For example, zero to 11. Zero to 11 is the range. So this guy has a range of about 11, okay? But when I look down at these other graphs, this one has a range of about seven. I've got a range of about eight. I've got a range of about nine, and I've got a range of about 10. All right, so what does this tell me? This tells me that if I take a sample, for my sample, the mean, so you know, I'm talking about the socks here, okay? The shape, the shape of the sample is really going to be very close to the shape of the population and vice versa, okay? No matter what your sample, sorry, whatever your population is, that tends to show up in your sample. So the shape, pretty good for a sample as a prediction of what the population looks like. Um, as far as outliers go, that's kind of difficult to tell. As far as the center goes, whatever the center of the population is, is most likely going to be close to the center of the sample itself. So maybe it's not exactly 2, maybe it's 1.75 or 2.8. But whatever you have as the center measurement of your population, you typically your um, sample will have a very similar center as well. But that spread, that spread is going to be way off. These samples, all of them underestimate spread. Okay, the spreads always end up, or I guess you should say most of the time, they end up um, with uh, a value that's too small. Okay, so statistically what happens is that the spread is vastly underestimated. 
okay, over and over and over again. Because the only way to get that population range is to, in your sample, get the smallest population value and the largest population value. And to actually pull those randomly into your sample, not a very good chance of that happening. So what that means is that your smallest number and your largest number, if those don't just happen to show up in your sample, then the range and the standard deviation and the interquartile range, all of those have a tendency to sort of underestimate the value. And I want you to try to keep this in mind for future chapters because it's going to be important then about how means do a good job of predicting other means, but ranges and standard deviations, they don't really do a very good job of predicting other ranges and standard deviations. Okay, now if I was going to make a histogram from scratch, we could use our TI Inspire and that will come in a separate video, a separate video. Okay, but um, if you were going to do this by hand, it's not too bad. So for example, I would usually start off a problem and I would look for the smallest number and the largest number. So in this problem, I scanned through and it says the paper, Lessons from Pacemaker Implantations, gave the results that followed 89 heart patients who had received electronic pacemakers. Um, and the time to the first electrical malfunction of the pacemaker was recorded. Okay, so I find my smallest number, it's 2, and I scan through and I figure out the largest number is 34. So I want my scale to go somewhere between, you know, 2 to 34. So I decide, what if I go by 5s? So if I go 0 to 5, okay, that's 1, 5 to 10, 10 to 15, 15 to 20, 20 to 25, 25 to 30, 30 to 35, that's going to be 7 um, bars, and those are going to be real easy ones to tally into as well. So I went to my horizontal axis and I went ahead and scaled that. Now you can see my little graph break here because I didn't want to put the zero right up against that vertical axis. So I just broke it and I started it over here. So I've got 0, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35. Okay, so I don't really want every single number because I don't want a ton of little tiny bars, but I, I think that that's, you know, five numbers per bar should be pretty good. Okay, the other thing um, after I've done that is I need to make a tally for the frequencies. So I start off with 0 to 5, but remember, it's not really 0 to 5. It's 0 up to 4, and then 5 will be included in that next bar up. So 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. There's still five values there. Okay, 0, 1, 2, 3, Four. Still five values, but it only goes up to four. So I scanned through, and you can see in my blue highlighter here, I found out there were two numbers from zero to four. The next bar goes from five to nine, but remember that includes the five, but it doesn't include the ten on the scale. So that's five, six, seven, eight, nine. It's still five numbers, it's still five wide. And you can see with the pink, I went through and I found all the numbers that went with um, that particular scaling. And then I did 10 to 15, but remember it really only goes up to 14 or 14.9999999. Okay. As it went there and there were actually 17, you can see those in green. Um, I went ahead and did the rest of these and I found that there were 18 between 15 and 20, 32 between 20 and 25, eight between 20 and 30 and 30 between, or sorry, and six between 30 and 35. So then after I had those tallies, I knew that my vertical axis needed to go up to 32. So I just really quick went like 10, 20, 30. So I scaled by tens on that vertical axis. And then I was ready to draw my bars. So remember the bars touch, they're equal width. Hopefully if you draw them a little better than mine. Okay. And the height of each bar should match the frequency of the, um, of it, that that set of numbers. So you can see here's the two that went from zero to five and the six that went from five to 10. So a histogram is really easy to sketch out, um, especially if you can kind of tally those numbers and get them into the spaces. Okay. So that brings us to our very last topic here. Okay. Along with histograms, we have something called a cumulative relative frequency plot. And sometimes this is called an ogive, an ogive. So a cumulative relative frequency, when you hear that word cumulative, it means like the sum up to this point. And the fact that we're talking about relative frequency means the percentage up to this point. So these are generally used to answer questions about what we would call a percentile. So a percentile is the percentage of individuals or, or values in your data set that are at or below a certain value. 
So for example, when I take my son to the pediatrician and they give me a little paper and they say his height is at the 70th percentile. What that means is if you were to line up 100 11 year olds in a row, that 70 of those would be the same height as my son or less and 30 of those kids would be taller than him. So a percentile says from this point, 70% of the values are here or below. Um, when you're talking about, say, a test score, if you score in the 90th percentile, it means 90% of people who took the test did as well as you or worse, and only 10% did better than you, okay? It doesn't tell you anything about your actual score itself. So you could have gotten an 85 and been in the 90th percentile, or you could have gotten a 100 and been in the, uh, you know, 90th percentile if there were extra credit. Okay, so it just tells you where you are in a line of people. So one of the words that we use quite a bit is quartile. Quartile is basically the percentiles at the 25s. So the first quartile is the 25th percentile. That means 25% of the data is at or below that point. The second quartile is the 50th percentile, and that's sometimes also called the median. So the median is at the 50th percentile. 50% 50 of the points are at or below that point. The third quartile is called the 75th percentile. Okay, so the other piece of that is we have a certain kind of spread that we're going to spend a lot of time with in the second chapter from here, the ch chapter four, and it's called the interquartile range. So you know range is from the maximum to the minimum. It's the distance from maximum to minimum. The interquartile range is the distance, the range of the middle half of the data. So you find that by taking the quartile three number minus the quartile one number instead of taking the maximum minus the minimum, okay? So if I'm looking at this data here, okay, the way this cumulative relative frequency plot is read, okay, over on the vertical axis, I have cumulative relative frequency, which is read as the percentage up to this point, okay? And then I have age here on the horizontal axis. So when I read, say, this value right here that has a point, I look down and that looks like that's about 65 years old. And I look over and that looks like it's about 90%. Okay, so I would read that 65 is at the 90th percentile. Or in other words, 90% of people are 65 or younger and 10% of people are 65 or older. Okay. So let's see if we can find these quartiles. So if I'm looking for the quartiles, the 25th percentile, I'm going to kind of eyeball that right here. So 25, here's where 30 would be. 25 is about right there. I'm going to look over. Looks to me like my 25th percentile um, is about 20, maybe 19. I maybe drifted that off to the right a little bit there. Okay, so 25th, maybe 19. All right, so quartile one, the 25th percentile, that is about 19. My median, so here's the 50th percent right there. If I look down, looks like my median, my median is about, say, I don't know, 33, okay? And my 75th percentile, I'm gonna call that 45. So quartile three, um, maybe 46, 46, yeah, a little bit more than half there. All right, so quartile three, that is 46. That's saying that 46 is the age, that 75% of people are younger than 46, which would mean that 25% of the people are older than that. To find this interquartile range, we would just subtract 46 minus 19, and we would end up with that uh, 27 years as that interquartile range. So the whole range, it looks like the data runs from about five years old to about 90 years old. So this data spans 85 years, but the middle 50% is only about 27 years in the middle. Okay. All right. So turn the page for the last couple examples here. All right, so the first question, it says cumulative relative frequency, and it says what percentage of fatalities occurred for people under age 55? All right, so I'm going to find age 55, 
and I want to find the percentage basically for everybody at or below 55. So I'm going to go up and I'm going to look in my picture and then I'm going to look over to see if I can put that on a percentage there. Okay, so I line that up, uh, maybe about 0.85. So about 85% are under age 55. Now, if 85% are under age 55, that would give us 15% above age 55. At what age do the youngest 30% of fatalities occur? So that would be the lower 30% here. So I'm going to find 30%. Okay, and then I'm going to look down, and that looks like that is about age 20. So about age 20 would be my youngest 30%. Now, if I wanted my oldest 30%, what if I wanted that instead, oldest 30%? That would be the top 30%. In order to find the top 30%, we would need to think, well, cumulative frequency tells me at or below. So if there's 30% above, that leaves me with 70% below. So if I found that 70% and kind of look over, my oldest 30% are going to be about 45 um, and older. Okay, so the oldest 45 and up would be my oldest there. Okay, if you ever had to construct one of these, okay, the first thing you would need to do is just like um, with making a histogram, you would want to separate your data by class. I've already done this. You can see that the I would separate in here. I've got 11 to 20, 20 to 31. These are all 10 wide. And then I'm going to put my, I'm going to count how many 11s to 20 do I have? I got six of those. How many 21s to 30 do I have? I have nine. And I've already tallied the rest of these. There were 13 in this category, 12 in this category, and four. Okay. As a grand total, this gives me 44 values. And we could use this to find relative frequency. So um, my 44, six out of 44 is about 14%. And uh, 9 out of 44 is about 20%. 13 out of 44 is about 30%. Lost my decimal point there. It ran away. Um, 12 out of 44 is about 27%. 4 out of 44 is about 9%. Okay. Now, to get cumulative frequency, I would take my frequencies here, and I'm just going to add them up. So working down this list, okay, um, I start off with 6. So from 11 to 20, there are 6. If I go from 11 to 30, there are 6 here and 9 here. 6 plus 9 give me 15. If I wanted to go from 11 up to 40, okay, from 11 to 40, there's 6 plus 9 plus 13, which gives me 28. Um, if I wanted to go from 11 up to 50, there's 6 plus 9 plus 13 plus 12. Put that together, and we end up with 40. And from 11 up to 60, that gives me my 44 when I add all those values together. Similarly, when I'm talking about the cumulative relative frequency, I'm going to take my relative frequency numbers and I'm going to add them up. All right, so I'm going to say, I'm going to start off with 14%. From 11 to 20 is 14%. From 11 to 30 is 14% plus 20%. That's 34. From 11 to 40, that's 14 plus 20 plus 30. That's 64. From 11 up to 50, 14 plus 20 plus 30 plus 27. Okay, that's going to give me 91. And if I add in that last 9%, it puts me up to 100. Okay, so in order to graph this information, the way you construct one of these cumulative relative frequency plots is that your um, vertical axis is cumulative relative frequency, which means you're going to put these numbers on your vertical axis. And then it's an up to and including number. So I'm going to use the upper boundary of my class as the other point. So basically, I'm going to plot points at 20, 14%. 3, 34%, etc. All right, so 20 and then 14%. I've got 30 and 34%. 40 and 64%. 50 and 91%. And finally, 60 and 100%. Then I'm going to draw 
my cumulative relative frequency line here, connect the dots so that I can answer questions. Okay, so a couple of questions about this then. Okay, what DRP score is at the 20th percentile? So I'm going to go 20%. I'm going to sketch over maybe about 24. What is the median DRP score? So I'm going to look for the 50th percentile. Uh, looks like approximately 35. What is the interquartile range? Okay, so to get the interquartile range, I need to have Q3, which is the 75th percentile, minus Q1, which is the 25th percentile. All right, so here's 70, 75. Mm, that looks like about 43. I'm guessing there. And then 25. Okay, I'm going to call that one, I don't know, 27. So 43 minus 27, we'll call that 16. Okay, and then it says a score of 40 is approximately what percentile? So we're going to work backwards on that one. So here's 40, I'm going to look up and then over. I get 60%, so that means I am at the 60th percentile. That means there's 60% at or below 40, which would mean there's 40% at uh, above 40 as well, okay? So working with a histogram um, is another way to express large sets of data. And then this cumulative frequency plot always kind of goes with histograms because it, it starts off, you're tallying information much of the same way that you would with a histogram. The data collection and the organization of it is pretty much the same, but it tells a different story. It allows us to work with these percentiles. And a percentile is something that I am, I'm very interested um, in with statistics in this chapter and in future chapters that we're going to deal with. All right, that's it.